Welcome everyone to today's program. I am Emily Rapley with Becker's Healthcare. Today we will begin with a presentation which will be followed by a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during this time. Shortly after completion of the program, you will receive a follow-up email. You can submit your feedback or any additional questions at that time. This email will not include the presentation. Within about a week following the webinar, you will receive an email that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Steve Kovac is the Director of Education at Healthmark Industries, located in Fraser, Michigan. He has been in the medical field since 1975, and he is celebrating his 41st year in healthcare. Stephen has a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Central Michigan University. He is active both on the state and national levels of various organizations and has held many positions. He has spoken internationally, nationally, and on the state and local level in a variety of subjects. He's an active voting member on various AAMI committees. He has also been an instructor at the community college level and published many articles and chapters and books varying in subject matter from perfusion to the importance of cleaning surgical instruments. Steve has been honored during his career with many awards in both his personal and professional life. He has held many positions over the years and out of all of them, he is always proud to say, I have worked in the heart of the hospital, central processing. We also have Mary Ann Drosnak, who is the manager of clinical education for endoscopy at Healthmark Industries where she provides expertise on endoscope reprocessing, often presenting at conferences on effective device reprocessing and infection prevention in endoscopy. Prior to Healthmark, Marianne managed the inf infection control program for Olympus America. There she had responsibility for infection prevention and device reprocessing. Prior to Olympus, Marianne worked as a pharmaceutical microbiologist and taught microbiology courses. Marianne has a bachelor's degree in biology and a master's degree in quality and regulatory affairs. She is certified in infection control, is a flexible endoscope reprocessor, and is nationally certified as a registered microbiologist. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Steve to begin today's presentation. Hi, everybody, and welcome very much. I want to start with uh, a welcoming again from Becker's and uh, Healthmark Industries, and just a couple slides about Healthmark and our company mission. And we're here to provide innovative and cost-effective products to the healthcare industry uh, customers in various ways in sterilization, decontamination, storage, distribution, and security needs. Our policy is really um, to educate our customers in all different ways, not only on our products, but best practices. And this webinar is our commitment to educating our customers and we thank you all for attending. So uh, this is a poll question. We want to know who is here today. So a question is going to pop up for you in just a second to answer. And the poll question should be coming up any second. And it should be coming any second for you to fill out. And the results should be coming any second. Um, they should be coming up. I don't see them. I'm sorry. But we want to know who is here today. And um, we're going to go to our next question. There's some. We want to know where you're from, if you're from the United States or Canada uh, or any place else. The poll question should be coming up. Um, I don't know what happened. Please forgive me. Um, well, I'm going to move on because it was supposed to come up. Please forgive me there. Um, I want to go through the objectives right now. We're going to talk about visually clean. We're going to define enhanced visual inspection. We're going to talk about what the various organizations are saying about 
visual inspection and what we call enhanced visual inspection. We're going to define the best practices for enhanced visual inspection of medical devices. We'll talk about lumen shavers, endoscopes, and other devices. Um, so, this slide here, you're seeing a few, unfortunately, dirty medical devices. Simple hemostat, the tip of a robotic arm, and the inside of a shaver. And as healthcare professionals, this quote is taken from Amy SD79. A problem analysis should be completed for any problem with any aspect of decontamination that can pose a risk to personnel or patients. The problem analyst should define and resolve the problem, and the system should be monitored to ensure that the problem has been corrected. So what we're going to be looking at is dirty medical devices and how visual inspection helps you solve this, and it should be part of your quality improvement process. What else does it say in Amy ST79? And one of the reasons we're quoting ST79 is that this is the Bible for those of us who are doing any type of medical device reprocessing, no matter where we're at, whether we're in a doctor's office, ambulatory care center, rural hospital, large hospital, urban hospital. This is, this is what we need to look at. And in section 755, it gives us some guidance on what we need to do. So after completing the cleaning process, personnel should visually inspect each item carefully to detect any visible soil. Inspecting using magnification might identify residuals more readily than the unaided eye. Visual inspection alone may not be sufficient for assessing the efficacy of the cleaning process. The use of methods that are able to measure organic residues that are not detectable using visual inspection should be considered in facilities cleaning policies and procedures. In SD79, there is what's known as Annex D, and many of those methods we're going to talk about later in the program. My partner, Mary Ellen, uh, Mary Ann, will talk about that. I wanted to share this with you because two years ago we did a workshop at ISHA, and it was on visual inspection. And this is very, very uh, important because in 2014, we're already five years away of what happened with um, the arthroscopy shaver. So we polled different people who was there. I know it's a small poll, but this was very, very insightful. And one of the questions I want to highlight here is, it's second from the bottom, before this workshop, did you know the issues associated with visual inspection or arthroscopy shavers? And if you can look, almost 50%, about 40% of the people who were surveyed five years later still had not heard about the arthroscopy shaver concern. What this also showed us is that we were asked them about the IFU and the importance of visual inspecting shavers and that only 7% of the respondents were actually doing this step of using some type of advanced or enhanced visual inspection of the shavers. And what was very important is a few years after 2009, the FDA had their summit on cleaning in one of the companies, Smith & Nephew, and you can find their presentation on the web. It's very easy. They talked about a survey they had done where actually no one was following the IFU completely the way they had outlined it. So um, that, again, is very important because we're going to ask you a few poll questions soon about where you're at when it comes to shavers and inspecting. But what's also important is Johan Azizi and a group of people from uh, the University of Michigan did an AORN article called Uphill Grind Process Improvement in Surgical Instruments. And this dealt with the complete picture of cleaning medical devices and the challenges that people were, were facing. So, um, have a definition here of visual inspection that I think is very important for us to talk about as we 
move ahead with this subject matter. The process of using the unaided eye alone or in conjunction with various aids such as a boroscope or as in um, ST79, something to identify the stain or the organic residue, to inspect medical devices or defects for its functionality, pitting, stains, imperfections on the medical device during its process cycle and rejecting the medical device according to the medical devices I have few. If any of these imperfections are found, and that's what it is. As someone who's reprocessing any medical device, you want to make sure it's clean and functional. So the first step in visual inspection, or the first standard is, is it visually clean? First and foremost, if it's visually dirty, you must re-clean it. And that's it's plain and simple. If it's dirty, send it back. But to understand and see this, sometimes we cannot see it with our unaided eye. So we then use basic magnification, whether it could be a handheld one or one that has the arm that uh, works at your workstation. Third, which is happening now, is what we're calling enhanced visual inspection. And again, the IFU gives us direction here. And we are going to talk about the shaver story in a little more detail and also endoscopes, what's happening now with some of the research and the importance of it. So in this third part, the technology is evolving and it's allowing us now to look inside these devices in places when I first started back in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, we didn't have the ability other than a magnifying glass. Now boroscopes, or what we call them flexible inspection scopes, where they're not made of a fiber optic, but they're a little more durable, that they can take the bending and twisting, that you can look into places that you've never seen before to see if it's actually as clean as it's supposed to. And other enhanced computer aided uh, visual inspections. There's these NIC 007s and other little uh, computer aided cameras that are now there to make it easier to inspect the in instruments to help our unaided eye look at things. Then the fourth step is then once you find out it's dirty or there's a stain, trying to identify that stain. And that is very key because you want to know if you can what was that stain? Then, say it was blood or protein or, or something like that, you then know where to start looking into your process. And it becomes a quality improvement of how do I change that? How do I reduce those stains from happening again? And again, the IFU will give us that direction. It'll say visually clean. Um, and also, as we've mentioned earlier, the standards and guidelines are now saying here are some tests that you might be able to use to identify the stains, because most of us are just used to maybe taking an eraser and deciding is it rust or not rust, is there pitting or so on. Now there are simple chemistries that can help you detect what's going on. And the last and most important step of all this is documenting your results. We all know if you didn't document something, you didn't do it. And that I'll touch a little more when I get into the shaver part of it because that is so key because of what happened in 2009 and you want to make sure you can document that you actually did look at it and say it was clean. So basic visual inspection. That's the most basic thing we use. It's looking at something through the cleaning process. Um, you're using your eyes, unaided eyes, and you're seeing, is it clean, is it functional, are the tips together, does everything look right? Um, that's what's important. Uh, again, you're looking at uh, box locks or pivot points, the instrument serrations, do the tips line up properly. You can do some of that with your naked eye, unaided eye, but others you have to use with some type of magnification and that's what comes in. This here is just at a regular workstation. If you look at the one picture with um, the lady, you'll notice she's looking at an arm type of magnifier, but on her table she has a little handheld. And on the other one, uh, that is myself, 
looking at an instrument and you can find support in ST79 that if you don't have one of these at your workstation you should and here's the importance of it many of us are using fine medical devices that are being used in surgery where the surgeons are using loops or magnification and they are looking at our instruments under that magnification and they can pick up nicks and burrs and even spots that the unaided eye cannot so it would only make sense that in the inspection of our instruments you would use some type of enhanced visual inspection to look at those instruments just as your customer would so if you don't have them uh, at each of your workstation you would then use a justification from SD79 saying these are some tools that you need for your staff or you to do the job properly. So this here you'll see a picture on uh, my left of the screen of just looking at a pair of curettes without any aid at all of um, any type enhanced visual inspection. You look at the right this is under simple magnification of one of the uh, magnifying glasses that you saw earlier. And if you look, you can see the difference in the two curettes that you might not have picked up with your unaided eye. And so now you have a couple issues you have to take care of. You see what a good curette is like, but you see what a poor curette is. Now you can go back to the people who are repairing or refurbishing those curettes and say, look, this is not meeting the spec of the original manufacturer. That should not be placed into uh, service because the surgeon will not be able to do what he's supposed to because as you can see, the nicks and how that was repaired or refurbished was not up to the original specifications. This next one is magnifying again versus the unaided eye. You see the picture at the top of a uh, minimally invasive instrument, even though it doesn't have a port, that's a whole other subject. With the naked eye, you can barely see that there's anything on the tip. But when you bring it under some type of magnification, you now see that whoever did the cleaning of this item didn't do it properly, whether they didn't use the right brush, didn't let it soak, or they did what I call a baptism where they just put it right in the sink and pull it out and send it through the window. But you can see what the magnification has done, that you now are able to catch some of these, then work with the staff to show them the importance of taking the time and doing what they're supposed to do. And this way, you increase your quality and you're putting out a good product. Um, excuse me for a second, I just, there we go. This here is an example, even though um, you could probably see the box logic area with the screw with your naked eye, but on the left is some of the simple new plug into your computer, plug and play, where you can look at instruments very easily and catch different parts of what could be wrong with them, and then you can document it. What's really good of having something attached to your computer is again, you can take a picture of it, document it, show what was taken, and use it as training later on for the rest of the staff. I want to talk briefly about the shaver issue. Many people thought this was the tipping point where this enhanced visual inspection sort of began. As we know, back in April of 2009, there was some issues. It was highlighted on the NBC Today show and a few others. Unfortunately, some patients got some infections that caused some issues with their shoulders. The FDA and CDC was brought in, and what they said is that the staff was doing everything correctly, but there was retained tissue inside certain parts of the shaver that the naked eye could not see. So then many of the manufacturers, after some reports from the FDA and strongly suggested they change their cleaning instructions and they added some steps. And what they added 
was finding solutions to look in the more difficult parts of these shavers. Visually inspect the handpiece. We recommend using a scope to visually inspect the lumens of the handpiece. So there's two parts. There's what they call the lumen step, where you hook up your suction, and then the dry fork area. And when you go through the lumen check part of it, there's a trigger on the shaver. And it's that trigger area where tissue actually gets stuck. And that's part of it. And you can't look inside there with the unaided eye. You need something like a flexible inspection scope or something to look inside. Here's an example of two IFUs. And the reason I put this up is this goes back to our poll question back in 2014. We asked people if they were following the IFU or what was going on. And some of them didn't know there was an issue and didn't even know that they should be looking in these areas of the shaver. So we all know that uh, many of the uh, auditors like Joint Commission and AAA, they're saying, what is your IFU? Show me what you're doing. You want to make sure you are in compliance with what the IFU said. So to look at these specific types of medical devices, you will need something small enough and to look in those areas. This here is now an enlarged area in that fork drive area that you can see the actual dirt in that. And this was taken from a, a shaver that somebody actually thought was clean and they were ready to wrap and put it into service. But showing them and taking pictures stressed to them the importance of figuring out a way to have this, these types of visual inspection tools to increase the quality and increase the patient's safety. And that's what it's all about, increasing the safety of our patients. So this here is an actual video and I want you to see this. Notice how clear it is. This was taken with a flexible um, inspection scope. And that is tissue that was actually retained. This was taken from a shaver that someone felt was clean. They did not have any type of enhanced visualization. We were showing it at their institution. And this product, this medical device was going to be put up and this here is actually showing you tissue that was left. Now, there are many reasons why this was left. One is when you deal with a shaver, you need three specific type of brushes on some of the models. They were not doing it properly. They were doing, again, what I say more, baptizing the uh, shavers by just quickly putting it in brushing and sending it through the pass-through window. And again, if they followed the IFU correctly, I doubt they would have as many as we saw that day that still had some tissue and that's left. That's where products like the inspection scope that is made specifically to look into these hard to find areas so you can make sure that device is clean. So then you can put it on your checklist and document it. And that's a question that comes up a lot is how do I document? What do I do? Well, how you handle that is if you have one of the uh, electronic computer systems, you make it a task where did you visually inspect it with a boroscope or a flexible inspection scope or some other device? Yes or no? Yes, you can do it. So then you go to the next task. If it's manual, you put it on your check sheet, like you're counting the hemostats. I visually checked it. Just as how you now check every insulated item to make sure there's no break in the insulation. This is now the same type of criteria you would do. And with some of the uh, inspection scopes, at least the ones we sell, you're able to do pictures and save them to the hard drive and show what a good one is and from that point on. So we're going to ask you a couple poll questions. So I'm going to take a few seconds here and I'm going to hand it back over to the um, uh, operator to pull up the poll questions for you. So if she will pull them up here in a second, hopefully they will come up on the screen. I'm waiting for them. 
Um, Hi there, Steve. Um, we can see the poll question. It says, do you process orthopedic shavers? Yes or no? Okay, would you um, click yes or no? And unfortunately, I'm not seeing them. So what are the uh, Sure, I have the results right here. It looks like 69% of our audience said yes, they do process orthopedic shavers, and 31% said no. Okay, we're going to go to our next question, and that is, if you answered, uh, uh, if you visually inspect the shaver with a boroscope before the final assem assembly, are you? So for our next poll question, if you answered yes, do you visually inspect the saver with a boroscope, like a flexible inspection scope, before the final assembly? Yes or no? And we'll just give it a few seconds to let our audience answer. And it looks like the majority of our audience, 82%, um, does not visually inspect the shaver with a boroscope, and 18% do. Wow, that is very interesting. Okay. Um, I'm now, thank you very much. I'm now going to talk briefly about lumens and suctions. And the reason I have this here, many people look into suctions and to see if they're visually clean and they don't know what a clean one is like. This is what a clean one should look like. And in the product we sell, we actually, you can put this picture so your staff can see what a good one looks like and you'll get a sharp picture. Here is actually pictures of uh, some suctions that should not be being used. They should either be recleaned if you can't reclean them, or sent out to be refurbished and go from that point. But again, this is suctions that, as you can tell, um, are not visually clean. Um, this here is the last, last slide I'm going to talk about and I'm going to hand it over to Mary Ann. I want to thank Johanna Zizi when he worked at the University of Michigan and the story and the articles they wrote. This is the classic picture of the uh, suction opened up and looking how dirty it is inside. And again, after years and years of cleaning and people don't know what's going on, we are now having to up the game when it comes to visual inspection. So. I'm going to hand it over to Mary Ann. And Mary Ann, if you could pick up from that point on. Uh, okay. I hope everyone can see the slides. From this point in the presentation, we're going to talk about enhanced visual inspection for endoscopes. So as far as the professional society recommendations go at this point, the current guidelines really do have a consensus uh, as far as AME, AORN, and SGNA go, that they now support a step of a visual inspection during reprocessing of flexible endoscopes. And this is in addition to the unaided eye visual inspection that hopefully many people have been doing in the past. So how do we verify clean? What are the recommendations per AME and AORN? Well, the general recommendations are that there should be uh, visual inspection of the endoscope, the accessories, and any associated equipment. This should be done throughout the process of reprocessing. So we should be looking for cleanliness, integrity, functionality, before use, during the procedure, after the procedure, especially after cleaning and before disinfection or sterilization. What's included in visual inspection per Amy and AORN? You should be inspecting for organic residues on the surface of the scope. You should be looking for any cracks in the device, looking specifically at the bending section for signs of damage. If using a fiber optic scope, you should be checking the integrity of those fiber optic bundles and using magnification, preferably lighted magnification. So the literature and collective evidence does support this visual inspection for endoscopes and associated equipment, again, after cleaning, prior to disinfection and throughout use of, uh, of, the, of the item. Also, Amy and AORN say that you should consider inspection with a boroscope. That is in the latest guidelines from 
both FT91 from 2015 and AORN's guideline for flexible endoscope reprocessing from 2016. The internal channels of the flexible endoscopes cannot be visualized without some sort of uh, use of a boroscope. Uh, we, there's no other way to see down the channel. So this does allow for improved visual inspection. There are many methods to measure organic and other residues that can be found on endoscopes and in the channels after cleaning. Some of those that are commonly used are tests for protein, tests for carbohydrates, tests for hemoglobin, combination tests thereof, ATP, and others. So these should also be incorporated as part of your verification and visual inspection. A little bit more on ST91. So cleaning verification is incorporated in Amy and in SGNA as part of the visual verification for cleaning. This is really meant to be performed after cleaning prior to disinfection. So per Amy ST91, it's, a, it's very important to incorporate visual inspection and testing of equipment to identify any conditions that could affect the cleaning or disinfection process. So in addition to testing for leaks, you would examine for cracks, you would check for integrity, as we said, because visual inspection alone may not be sufficient to detect remaining debris. As part of visual verification and cleaning verification, as we said, that includes a visual inspection program, as well as testing for the cleaning efficacy of any manual cleaning equipment that you have in use during reprocessing. You would also monitor any key cleaning key cleaning parameters, such as temperature of any detergents or disinfectants that are used. Per the recommendations in Amy ST91, you should also use methods to detect organic re residues that may be present on the endoscope. And we talked about what those were, and we'll see those again in more detail shortly in the presentation. This is more detail about ST91 and what it specifically says as far as cleaning verification, which is part of your enhanced inspection. It does say that you would consider use of a boroscope to visually inspect the inter internal channels of the medical device. You would also use some sort of method to determine if there is any residual organic or other type of residue left on the test on the item after cleaning. Let's now move to what SGNA recommends. So just this year, SGNA put out a new recommendation for their standards of infection prevention and reprocessing of flexible endoscopes. SGNA now does include visual inspection as a new step. And this step was incorporated after the manual cleaning process prior to high-level disinfection. And SGNA considers this a timeout, what they're calling a safety stop. And this allows your technicians or staff to verify that the scope is at least visually clean prior to moving on to disinfection. We know that items have to be visually clean or they can't be disinfected or sterilized appropriately in the next step. Cleaning verification is included in the step of enhanced visual inspection within SGNA since you can't visualize the internal channels. What's good about incorporating it at this step along the way is if you do see retained debris on the external surfaces of the, surfaces of the scope, or if you're using your cleaning verification test and that flag is positive, at this point you just have to reclean the scope prior to moving on. So that's why it's incorporated at this step after cleaning prior to disinfection, so that you can easily repeat the manual cleaning step if necessary. SGNA also does recommend use of magnification and adequate lighting to assist in visual inspection. So where do we inspect the flexible endoscope? I have some items listed here as areas that you may want to inspect on the endoscope. You would look at the instrument channel, and to do that, you would need to use some sort of boroscope. And this not only applies to the endoscope itself, but you would also want to inspect the accessories, the, any associated equipment used with the endoscope, you would use the boroscope to look down the channel. You would also look at the distal tip. You would look at the forceps elevator if you have a duodenoscope, and the recess, both sides of that forceps elevator. 
and you would look at any connection points, such as the valve housing. You would also have to look at the bifurcation of the channel, so that would be internally, and where different materials be inside, such as where you have mated, uh, mated materials that do bump up against each other. So that would be going in through the biopsy channel um, and down the scope just slightly, and then also up from the distal tip up toward the control section. You would want to inspect your endoscope for cleanliness, so that means any routine debris or soil. You would look for any missing parts. You would look for clarity of lenses, integrity of seals, any moisture remaining on the scope or in the channels. You would look for physical or chemical damage and the overall functionality of the scope. And it's at this point, if you would identify any debris or any damage to the scope, that you would remove the equipment from service. And if you see it's soiled, you would reclean the endoscope. There are other issues or other guidance out there that do support use of enhanced inspection methods. Of course, we've had numerous reports of infections tied to contaminated scopes over the last few years, um, especially with the duodenoscopes. And the FDA recently put out this report that it shows as many as 350 patients and at 41 different medical facilities around the world have been infected or exposed to organisms through use of contaminated endoscopes. And that's over the last five year period and there have been more um, as of 2016. So using enhanced visual inspection and cleaning verification methods are ways to build quality into reprocessing of flexible endoscopes. Also, we have this poster, which was displayed at AORN this year, and the research was performed by Ofsted and Associate, Associates, which is a research group that specify, specifically looks at endoscope reprocessing and the issues that surround it. In their research, they used a boroscope for examination of the internal endoscope channels. In their study, they found significant numbers and amount of damage and debris left inside the channel after proper reprocessing was performed. They also noted that they saw residual fluid and damage to many channels. Overall, they found that 71% of the endoscopes that were inspected failed to meet the criteria for a patient-ready endoscope. And because they also incorporated culturing into this research, they found that about 29% of them harbor viable microorganisms, such as bacteria, after reprocessing. This poster is available on Ofsted's uh, website, which I have listed below. So you can see this is incredibly interesting and shows the value of inspection uh, with the boroscope after reprocessing. In here, they also did tests uh, for cleaning verification indicators and found that many of the scopes uh, were not passing that cleaning indicator after the cleaning process prior to disinfection. So this slide shows examples of lighted visual inspection tools that can be used for endoscopes and what a typical instrument suction channel looks like, a clean one under examination with a boroscope. So on, on the left, you have a flexible inspection scope, also known as a boroscope, that's tied to a computer so that you have these digital images in a library and you also have a comparison of what a clean instrument channel would look like there on the right. On this slide, you can see another type of lighted magnification tool that's available uh, commercially for visual inspection of instruments and for flexible endoscopes specifically. Also there on the middle and the right, you can see some types of damage that might be found on the endoscope when you're using enhanced visual inspection. Some of these are chemical damage, peeling, cracking, bubbling, and if those items or the, that damage is noted during inspection, then you can remove the endoscope from circulation so that it's not used on another patient. On this slide, here you have an example of what can be found using a boroscope for examination around the distal tip. This photo shows a crack in the weld joint at the water jet nozzle. And this was not found by the leak test that was performed by the facility. The schematic drawing on the right shows a typical distal end of a scope, which you would also visually inspect with a boroscope or your, uh, or your lighted magnification. And you would look for 
cracks in the lenses, you would look for glue joints that have deteriorated or any other signs of damage. So as we said, monitoring your cleaning process through cleaning verification indicators is part of the visual inspection process per SGNA and the other uh, professional society recommendations. So what is consistent between the recommendations from Amy, AORN, and SGNA is that cleaning verification for flexible scopes should be performed at regular intervals. What varies is the interval uh, that they give as an example. So Amy ST91 recommends regular intervals such as weekly or preferably daily to perform cleaning verification tests as part of your inspection process. ARN recommends regular intervals, such as with each reprocessing cycle or daily, whereas SGNA leaves it a little more open for interpretation. They say it should be performed at a regular pre-established pre interval at a frequency determined by the facility. This slide shows us a diagram of commercially available types of cleaning verification monitors that you may use in your facility. On the left-hand side, we have flush methods. So you would flush sterile water through the endoscope, recapture that, do a dipstick type test, which looks for residual carbohydrate, protein, and hemoglobin together in one method. You also have swab methods there shown in the middle where you would take a sample from the channel and test that for either residual or residual protein or hemoglobin through using a wetted swab, which is run through the channel. And you look for a color change as shown uh, in the picture there at the bottom in the middle. You also have ATP systems, which are commonly used for cleaning verification testing. And there are various types of systems available. And you can use either flush samples, where you flush through the channel, or swabbing methods. So once you've performed your cleaning verification, and you've looked for visual inspection, what if you do see retained debris or stains left on the scope or other medical device? Then it is recommended that you identify what that stain is. So stain identification is the final step in the process of visual examination. So this means if you do have a stain or debris, shouldn't you figure out what it is so that you can um, update your procedures or do a corrective action? So you have to take into account what is the type of surface that you have. Um, and then that would help you determine which type of test you would use to identify what the stain is. Is it a flat surface or is it a channel? There are commercially available products for each of those types, for swabbing or flushing, that look for specifically either residual hemoglobin or protein or other organic soils um, that would be left on your medical device. So you really have to know uh, what you, do you want a test to tell you? So what are you specifically looking for? And let's look at that in more detail. As far as stain identification goes, why would you do this? Well, I have the link there at the top of the slide from the FDA. So according to the FDA, visual detection alone does not allow one to detect residual bio burden that re may remain on clean devices. And then we have information lower in that slide from Dr. Alpha from, from pretty long ago in 1996, where she demonstrated that there was a growing concern about the effectiveness of decontamination uh, for reusable medical devices. So in that study, she had shown that there were differing ab abilities of sterilization technologies to achieve acceptable sterility assurance levels and that remaining debris could greatly impair uh, the sterilization ability of the technologies. As far as stain identification goes for surfaces of medical equipment, you'll see in this slide some dirty instruments. On the bottom there, you have hemostats on the pegboard in sterile processing. And you see the, remain the stains or the debris that's remaining there on those items. So, you may want to uh, determine what that stain would be. It can help you in a corrective action to build quality into your procedure to know is that rust or is that retained blood or is that protein. So how would you do that? So in this particular facility when we went in, uh, we looked at these hemostats and did test them for residual soil. And what we found was that some of them were rust and some of them did contain blood. So it's important to know uh, that what your soil is so that you can correct the process. And in order to do this, they had to update the cleaning practices 
but they were also storing those hemostats. They were putting them away wet. So we, all, we also had to look at their practices as far as ensuring that instruments were completely dry prior to hanging them up. <clears throat> Another issue that we commonly see is related to hard water. So many facilities will see staining left on their devices and think that it's just hard water. But is it really hard water? And there's no way to know just by looking at it. So here we have a picture of some hard water stains there on the bottom left, or what the facility thought was hard water. But when we went in there, we actually tested them for residual hemoglobin. And what came up was a positive result. So what that means is, although this facility thought it was just hard water, it ended up being residual blood left on these instruments. And when they looked at their process, they found that they weren't loading their washer properly, that they had overlap of areas, and that they weren't pre-rinsing the instruments. So they were actually putting them in the washer bloody and thinking that it would be able to adequately remove it. So uh, the staff then on the other side, when they took them out, chalked it up to hard water and instead just wiped them with alcohol. So by identifying this stain that it was blood, they were able to significantly improve their processes. In this photo here, you can see a yellow film left on the wall of the washer. So the facility had just been using this washer and didn't think anything about the yellow residual film that was on the inside. But if that was you, don't you think that that should be identified to know what's going on, so that you can fix the process? So what happened here? By looking into what the residue was on the side of their washer, they were able to determine that they were using too much detergent and that resulted in too much foaming and which wasn't properly rinsed away during the normal washing rinsing cycle and we tested that with a protein check and it did come up positive for protein but by identifying what the stain was they were able to make corrective action and build quality into their procedures so now that you've identified your stain you do have to document it and this slide shows you in a court of law, the medical record is the care that's rendered. So it has to be documented or you can't prove that it was done. So it's all well and good if you're performing your enhanced visual inspections and you're identifying stains. But if you don't document those results and record them, then that's really never truly part of your inspection. So we need to figure out ways to not only do the inspections, but to document them appropriately. So now we're gonna launch a poll question and this says, are you presently using any type of magnification for inspection of medical devices in your department? And then if so, what type? So I'll turn it over. Excellent, so I'll just jump in here with the poll results. Um, the question is, are you presently using any type of magnification for inspection of any medical devices in your department? If yes, what type? And it looks like 24% of our audience members said no. 57% um, said yes, they use a bench type magnifier mounted to a work table. 13% um, said yes, they use a handheld magnifier. 5% said yes, they use a flexible inspection scope or boroscope, and 1% said yes, they use other. Okay, we have another poll question coming up next. So do you use magnification on the dirty side for visual inspection, so on the decontamination side? and then follow up to that on the clean side and at each work, each work site, station. And it looks like our results are in. Uh, most of our audience members, 68% said no. 21% said yes, I use this at each station. And 11% said yes, but I do not use this at each station. 
Okay, very good. Thank you for answering those questions. Another question here. If, our, if you are using any type of boroscope for inspection, what type of devices are you looking at with this boroscope? And then, do you feel that the use of enhanced visual inspection, such as with a boroscope, helps to improve the quality of work in your department? And then we'll have one more quest, one more set of questions. And it looks like our results are in. 27% um, of our audience uses orthopedic shavers. 29% uh, uses flexible endoscopes. 27% said suctions. 24% said reamers. And 35%, the greatest share of our audience, said other devices. OK. And then does use of the Enhanced visual inspection, such as with a boroscope, improve the quality of work in your department. And it looks like the results are in. Uh, an overwhelming share of our audience, 93% said yes, and 7% said no. OK. Thank you, everyone, for answering that. We have one more slide with questions on it, and then we'll wrap up for the afternoon. So the question is, do you presently test or check any of your instruments for residual organic soil? So this is, do you use cleaning verification tests presently? And if yes, which type of cleaning verification test do you use? All right, it looks like 70% of our audience does not presently swab instruments after cleaning. 14% um, do swab and they use hemoglobin, 18% use protein, and 9% do swab but they use something other than hemoglobin or protein. Okay, very good. Final question then for the day. Before this presentation, did you know the issues associated with visual inspection of arthroscopic shavers, yes or no? And I'll just jump in the res with the results here. 56% um, of our audience said yes, and 44% said no. OK. So thank you, everyone, for answering those questions. So let's wrap up now with a little review. As we said, the first standard is, is it visually clean? So we must look at our devices to ensure that there's no retained debris on them. So first and foremost, it must be visually clean. If it appears to be dirty, then it needs to be Recleaned, and you may want to identify the stain to improve your process overall. The second step would be to use some sort of magnification, preferably a lighted magnification to inspect those devices. The third step in the process is use of enhanced visual inspection tools, looking at your instrument's IFU to give us direction, and talk, we talked about that shaver story. We know that technology is evolving rapidly, and there are now instruments available such as the boroscope, the flexible inspection scopes, and enhanced computer-aided design that will allow us to see in places that we couldn't see in before, such as the lumen of the flexible scopes or lumens of any medical device. And then the next step in the process would be if you do see a stain, 
that you should try and identify what the stain is, and that will help to enhance or build quality into your repractic reprocessing practices to identify what the problem is so that you can correct it. And then finally, the last step in the process is to make in, in inspection part of your quality process. And to do that, you not only need to perform it, but document those results appropriately. Next slide is some helpful charts on enhanced visual inspection that are available on the HealthMark website at www.hmark.com. You can use these to help you walk through how to do enhanced visual inspection and what stain what stains look like and what the possible causes may be for those stains remaining on your instrument. So remember this picture that we saw earlier in the presentation? So this hemostat was going to be put into a set as is. So as you see it there with the picture on the left, the facility thought this was, uh, was proper to use, that it was a good, of good quality because they had become used to instruments looking this way. Um, so therefore, you know, maybe this facility should have identified that this stain was not a normal process or normal part of what a clean instrument should look at, look like. So when we went into this facility then, we ran a hemoglobin test on that stain uh, that you can see there in the center of the picture. And it was clearly positive for blood residue. So it may appear to be soil or rust in the joint, but it did turn out to be blood, and that is not acceptable. So use of enhanced visual inspection processes and cleaning verification tests will help to identify that staining. So this next slide here shows you some references that were used in the presentation, including the AMI standards, AORN guidelines, and SGNA uh, standards for infection prevention, and others were noted on the slide that you can refer to directly for more information. HealthMark, of course, offers some visual inspection products that can help you see where the naked eye cannot. You have the flexible inspection scope on the left, you have the USB microscope in the bottom, and the lighted magnification on the right. And then finally, for CEU information, to receive your credit, you must go to the link that is listed at the bottom of this slide and fill out the form that you'll find at that link. And then we will email the CE certificate to you. And this is approved for one credit hour from both ISHM and CBSPD. So please ensure that you get your credit as credit is due and go to that link and fill out the form. And we appreciate that. So at this point, we do have just a few minutes for questions. And anything that we can't answer online now, we'll be sure to uh, get back to you with more information. So, and then finally, here's our contact information. So let's take a look at some of those questions now. Thanks, Marianne and Steve. That was a very informative and enjoyable presentation. So as Marianne mentioned, we'll now begin the Q&A portion of the program. Just a quick reminder to our audience, you can submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. So just to jump right in for our first uh, question from the audience, this came up when Steve was um, first talking about arthroscopic shavers and how the FDA um, found one that had residual tissue even after it had been properly cleaned. Um, so this audience member would like to know why not change the design of the devices? I can um, speak firsthand to this and I want to put kudos out to a lot of the orthopedic uh, companies that they are in the process of changing the design of these shavers. As we all know, sometimes it takes a little longer, but I do know many of the companies are changing the design to make them easier to inspect. Um, it's not my place to say the companies in that, but being a member of Amy, the orthopedic uh, companies are there and they hear what's going on and they're doing a really good job of changing the design. So yes, it is taking place. Thanks, Steve. Um, for our next question, are there any other medical devices that suggest the use of a boroscope to verify that instrument is visually cleaned in their IFU? Well, um, they all say to be visually clean. Uh, I'll take part of it. I don't know if Mary Ann has anything more to say. So when it says visually clean, I think that leaves it up to the person processing the device to use whatever tools they have necessary. And that gets back to the one of the first slides that 
what do you have to make sure that it's visually clean? It might not say use a boroscope or something else, but there are tools there that you need to enhance what you do to make sure that it is visually clean. And the example I gave earlier is your surgeon is using loops or magnification to look at your instruments. You should be doing the same whether it says that in the IFU or not because that's a scrutiny they're looking at. You should use the same scrutiny. I don't know. Do you have anything to add, Marianne? I think that's good follow-up, Steve. As far as on the endoscope side, uh, there are none that none of the IFUs that require use of a boroscope at this time. There is one IFU or maybe two at this point for duodenoscopes that say they should be inspected around the forceps elevator with magnification. But that's that's the only thing I have to add. Now Marianne, let me ask you this. That then should be they should have some type, whether it's handheld or something, to really inspect and move that elevator, not just look at it correct. They should try to move it in the Correct. different positions? Correct. Okay. Thanks, Steve and Marianne. It looks like we have time for one more question. An audience okay. member would like to know, do technicians need to inspect the complete length of channels in a flexible scope, such as a colonoscope? Sorry, excuse me. Okay. I'll take that one, and that's a good question. Um, and some. Some will allow you to inspect the entire length of the scope, but what we've found through inspection of many scopes um, at different facilities is you have key problematic areas, as I had noted during the one slide. Those would be inside valve housings where there's uh, bends in the channel, which are all which are at the top uh, by the control section where the bifurcation is, which is where the suction and the uh, biopsy channel meet. So again, at the control section. And then you come down slightly from that, and you have areas where different materials butt up against each other. So that's an area where you often see retained moisture. So from there, the channel is a continuous segment until you get to the bottom or the distal end of the scope, at which you have materials, again, that change. And that can be an area that's uh, problematic also. So as long as you're inspecting from the top down as far as you can and the bottom up, we're really hitting the key areas uh, that you, we see most of the damage and debris retained. Yes, it is possible that you could have uh, some scratches in the channel in the toward the middle of the scope, but those are are less common areas of concern of what we see uh, historically based on inspection of these scopes. And let me just add this, Mary, and I know we're running out of time, but both um, I think we should uh, take our hats off to. Uh, the Ofsted group and Dr. Alpha up in Canada, they have been more or less on the forefront of where this is at and where it's going and it's going to take a lot more research and people out in the field sharing and networking what they're seeing so we can improve our process and finding ways to do that and I hope this program has helped you look to find quality and put quality into what you do and enhance visual inspection should be part of that. So um, that's what I wanted to close with. Very good. Thank you, Thank you Steve. And, and thanks to everyone for joining today. today. I just want to thank uh, both Steve and Marianne again for their excellent presentation and thank our audience for participating today. We look forward to having you join us again for future webinars. This concludes today's program. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.